We're going to have a look at Samuel. A few weeks ago, we had a look at an incident that's recorded in the book of, of Samuel concerning King David, restoring the Ark of the Covenant back to its rightful place at the center of the people. Kind of, uh, it, it had been lost in battle um, and casually left in a rural backwater, seemingly forgotten the Ark. And it's, it's a picture. It was a picture of the nation's spirituality, a comment on where uh, God truly featured in their lives, not at the center at all kind of pushed to the margins and um and then we looked at how david a man we're told with a heart after god's heart how he came along and began sorting some things out in the spirituality of the nation actually it was god doing the sorting out it was god who'd begun many many years before david was born to put a plan in place to bring his people back and we're going to have a bit of a look at that. How will he do it? How will he go about it? Where will he begin in this need to renew his nation, his people, Israel? So if you have your Bibles, if you want to switch them on or turn to them, the verses will come up on the screen as well. And I'm going to invite Alan. Alan's going to come to the front. Uh, we're into Old Testament, and these are stories. They're quite a little bit longer readings, but we need the longer reading to get the, um, the story in our heads. So I'll shut up and uh, let Anna, Alan uh, bring the reading for us. Okay, you can see there it comes from uh, 1 Samuel, chapter 1. I won't tell you which verse it's going to end at, because that might scare you. <laughs> there was a certain man from Ramathim, a Zophite from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, son of Jeraham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuth, an Ephraimite. He had two wives. One was called Hannah, and the other, Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah had none. Year after year, this man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. Whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife Penina and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her and the Lord had closed her womb. Because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. Her husband Elkanah would say to, ha to, say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? Once, when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli the priest was sitting on his chair by the doorposts of the Lord's house. In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. And she made a vow saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life and no razor will ever be used on his head. As she kept on praying to the Lord, he observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart, and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. And Eli thought she was drunk, and said to her, How long are you going to stay drunk? Put away your wine. Not so, my Lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I've not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. Eli answered, Go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. And she said, May your servant find favour in your eyes. Then she went uh, her way, and ate something, 
and her face was no longer downcast. Early the next morning they arose and worshipped before the Lord and then went back to their home at Ramah. Elkanah made love to his wife Hannah and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time Hannah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel saying because I asked the Lord for him. When Alan and I were talking about the reading he said uh, he said oh, you gave Christine a tough reading with all those names in the other week didn't you? So I gave him a harder one Christine okay just try and make it up for you so he uh, had far more there so there we go. Um, who does God choose to work with and through? Uh, just as I was sitting there, I had um, a, a little picture way back when, when I was a lad. I was about, uh, I don't know, about 21, something like that. And I took my first service in Wrexham in North Wales. And um, at the end of it, um, one of the ladies, uh, who, who she said, I didn't know he had it in him. I really didn't know he had it in him. So that was that. I thought, okay, fair enough, great. So <laughs> clearly she hadn't been impressed up until that point, but uh, there we go. Who does God choose to work with and who does he choose to work through? What's he looking for? How does uh, God choose? What are his criteria? What's he looking for when he's trying to raise up leaders, when he's wanting to bring spiritual reform to a people, a nation, the world, whatever? And I think we'd probably say that God looks at the heart. Yeah? God looks at the heart. That, I think, is his starting point. He's not really interested in all the letters after our names or the balance in our bank account or the car that we drive or the house that we live in and all the rest of it. He looks inside. That's his starting point. His ways are not our ways, are they? And, and I think when we, when we start thinking about things like renewal and revival of a nation, of a people, of a country, where does God start? We sometimes, in the places where we might not ordinarily expect things to happen, Often revival comes when it's just two or three people praying in a little room somewhere out of the way. Nobody knows they're doing it, but they've been doing it for quite a while. And if you look at many of the revivals in this country, that's how they've started. Where does God start? Let's get some context so we know where we're coming from. When we dipped into Samuel last time, I mentioned that at this point, in the nation's history, in Israel's history. Spirituality as a nation is, is not in a good place. Uh, their faithfulness to God is at a bit of a, a low ebb. Mm, Back in the past, hundreds of years before, Moses had been raised up. He'd led the people as God delivered them from Egypt, took them out, and he led them for 40 years. Then Joshua came along, led the people into the promised land, the land of Canaan that God has said, I will give you this place i will make you a people i'm covenanting with you i'll look after you and joshua led them in but once there and once joshua had died reached his, his old age and gone to the lord once they were there things seemed to slip a bit for the israelites they they kind of settled a little bit too easily um, and instead of overcoming the, the, the local practices and the local idolatry, instead of overcoming all of that that was going on, they were influenced by them, and they bought into some of it, and they allowed some of those practices and false worship to creep in to their own lives and water down their faithfulness That's what to, doing now. to God. False worship mm -hmm. crept in. And now we get to this point in 1 Samuel where there is plenty of religious ritual going on, going through the motions of going to church, as we call it, going through the motions of going to the place of worship. But actually the stuff in here, in the heart, and by the time we reach the end of Judges, the neighboring nations are giving the tribes of Israel a really hard time. Lots of beating up going on, and uh, we, we can read loads of that in uh, the book of Judges. And yet, there is still hope. It's patchy, 
But there is still faith and there are some folk out there who still know who God is and are still worshipping. Last summer, we looked at Naomi, Ruth and Boaz. That's an example of that faith that was still there. So in this first chapter in 1 Samuel, it's a bit of an introduction, but we are introduced to some names and we'll discover more about these names, these people uh, in weeks to come. But where will God start and with whom? Will he start with the priests, with Hophni and Phinehas? They're the spiritual leaders. They're supposed to be the giants before God who lead the people to God and help them stay uh, in the right place before God? Will he start with them? Or maybe with their father, Eli, the retired priest, the elder statesman of the nation, the kind of notional leader still, the last judge, if you like. Maybe he'll start with him, the veteran elder. Why not? These are difficult times for the nation of Israel. And interestingly, they're difficult times for this woman called Hannah. Hannah. Not maybe the starting place that you'd think of. You'll have heard the, the story before, the story of this, this woman. She's desperate, desperate. In her culture and in her context, Um, that whole being a matriarch thing, having lots of children around you and all the rest of it, it's quite important socially there. And it hadn't happened for her. And it looks as though her husband, even though he dearly, dearly loved her, uh, he needs an heir and he's taken a second wife by the look of it as well. And she's doing well. She's got lots of kids around. And then there's Hannah. She's suffering greatly as the years go by. Looks as though she's not been blessed at all because that's how they interpreted uh, these things. Wife number two never misses an opportunity. Never misses an opportunity to rub a bit of salt into that wound because she knows that Hannah's hurting And she's going to make the most of her advantage while she can. And even though husband Elkanah, clearly a man of faith, he's got those religious rituals going on, and clearly he loves Hannah deeply. The home situation seems comfortably well off as well, so overall it looks okay. Even though the picture painted is of a sound family, she is desperately unhappy. She's got a burden. She's got a burden. And she is one of a number of many remarkable women of faith in the Bible. She's numbered among people like Sarah and Rebecca, Rachel, um, Manoah's wife, the mother of Samson, is another one. She's numbered among them, Elizabeth, even pointing to Mary. She's right up there, is Hannah. Does she know it? No. Does it feel like she's part of God's plan? No. All she feels is the burden and this sense of desperation that's going on in her life. She's part of something far more significant than first appears because actually God has a plan and God is working his purposes. God includes ordinary folk in the outworking of his purposes and sometimes he includes our burdens in that as well. Maybe even it's our burdens that shape us and make us more useful to God, more open to asking him in. God's people are not doing well. 
The time of the judges leading Israel is coming to an end, and currently there's no real national leader out there anymore. Faith has reached this low point, and whilst old Evar, Eli oversees things as best he can for the nation, it's his two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, who are at the business end of leading the people in worship now and religious practice. And here's the thing. They are not good men. Sure, they're at the front. They're doing all this religious stuff. They're going through the motions. But we will discover in weeks to come that they are not good men. Have a look at the next couple of chapters if you want to read ahead. God is looking to raise up a leader. Where does he start? And this is one of those step change moments in the Old Testament when something that's been going along for years, God decides, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm going to do it differently. And this is one of those moments that's going on. It's a story of cradle and kingdom. And it's going to start in the cradle. God plays the long game. God is on the move to bring his people back to himself. This is going to be a catalyst time. It's going to see kings leading Israel in a generation of two's time. That's the first time. And it's going to see the appearance of a king called David. From whom will come Jesus in his family lineage? And Hannah is right there in the center of what God is up to that will eventually lead to Jesus, it's incredible. And all she feels is her burden, her pain. I don't fully understand why God chooses to, to work things out through some of our, our trials and our hurting. But history tells us that he does. Men and women of faith are not without problems in life. Just think of Job. Just look back at the book of Job. It's as though such times reveal some, some quality or something in our faith. Maybe it's to do with patience or, or perseverance, perseverance in prayer. Maybe it's to do with faithfulness in tough times. Maybe it's to do with trust. For those parents among us uh, carrying the worry of wayward children, as we just prayed, that picture of the, the, the prodigal son, it even paints God as the burdened parent, the loving parent of a difficult child waiting and hoping for a change of heart. God, I think, understands burdens. He does. He understands pain. He carries a burden for the world, for this world. Why else would he have sent Jesus? Why else? Back to Hannah. And it looks as though Hannah has been carrying this pain for, for years, actually. For years. And she's been praying for years. And I suspect her praying has been shaped. And the shape of her prayers has changed. This year, things come to a head. This year, her prayers take a different shape. And she makes a vow as part of her praying. And as she does so, as her will and her praying is shaped and comes into line with God's will, something falls into place in God's kingdom purposes. A combination of her situation and her burden and her pain and her faith and her trust in God shape this different prayer. And she says, Lord, oh Lord Almighty, if if you will only look upon your servant's misery and remember me, remember me, And not forget your servant, but give her a son. Then I will give him to the Lord. I'll give him back to you. 
for all the days of his life, and, and more, no razor will ever be used on his head. In other words, she's committing him to be a Nazarite. And a Nazarite was an Israelite who was consecrated to the service of God, under vows to abstain from things like alcohol, they let their hair grow, and they would avoid any sort of defilement. They would try to be holy, try to live a holy life. They would be dedicated to God. She prays this prayer in this state of I guess a distress, really. And here's the thing. God hears. God answers. And the boy born to Hannah, Samuel, whose name means um, from Yahweh I asked for him or asked of God. That's his name. Every time his name is cried out, you know, when he's when he's uh, growing up and he's messing about and she shouts out, Samuel, stop doing that. What she's actually saying is, asked of God, stop doing that. Asked of God, stop doing that. It's great when your name has meaning. Samuel is set apart for God's purposes. And he will become the last and probably greatest of the judges leading Israel. He's going to be a mighty man of God. He's going to be a king maker. He's going to anoint both Saul and David. For those of us who pray with tears, and we do, I know we do, I know you do. For those of us who pray with tears sometimes, who struggle to find the words because of what's sometimes called the, the bitterness of the soul, how it feels inside. We're in good company. We are in good company when we're praying like that. Tears can constitute prayer. Psalm 6, for the Lord has heard my weeping. But being in that place, that can be the place where God uses us. When we're at our wit's end and outside of our own resources, that's when we let God in. Yeah, we do. And God made a gift, made a gift of a son to Hannah. And she in turn gifted him back to God. And desolation was the place where God began. He looked at her heart and he took god takes the the total inability the total hopelessness the helplessness the the utter incapacity he takes her her nothing because that's how it feels he takes it but he also took her faith her persistence her burden her prayers her humility before him and he shaped it that stuff of her life he took it and shaped it and incorporated it into his plan and his purpose his kingdom purpose and in this case shaped them into his big plan that points down the line centuries down the line to Jesus and change the world. That's what she's part of here. God looked at Hannah's heart. Hannah's persistent faith shaped her praying until it chimed with God's kingdom purposes. And the son she prayed for will become significant prophet, a priest, a leader for God. This gift from God to Hannah, this, this child becoming pregnant, it seems relative, relatively immediate, the way, the way the prayer is prayed and it's answered, but I suspect she'd been praying for years. This has taken a long time for her to get to this point. We get the impression that Samuel is born roughly within a year of this prayer being prayed, and within another five years, 
young Samuel will have left his mum and he'll be serving in the temple in the temple at, at Shiloh with Eli. But it will take many years. The story is going to develop and grow. Many years for Samuel to mature into his ministry, be part of the big events God has got in mind. We, when we pray, we so often pray for results immediate. We want to see it now. When maybe God invites us to play a part according to his timetable. This will take a while to develop and shape up, but we'll follow it and see how God gives the increase. Back um, more recent times, uh, a century or so ago, there was a great preacher called D.L. Moody. Some of you would have heard of D.L. Moody. He had an amazing ministry, did Moody as an evangelist preacher. He was uh, bringing thousands and thousands and thousands to faith during a great time of, rev of revival. And yet, it all started when Moody was just a 17-year-old nobody. And a guy called Edward Kimball prayerfully witnessed to Moody, the young 17-year-old. Moody, he, he could not have known that this young lad would have made such an enormous kingdom difference as he ministered right up to the age of 62. But Kimball just faithfully did what he did shared his burden before God, the one that God had laid on him to witness, and the plan unfold. There's another guy called Leonard Ravenhill, and he says this, preaching affects time. I preach, you hear it, that's all today. Prayer affects eternity. Prayer affects eternity. Prayer works. Prayer works. Doesn't necessarily always fit in with our timeline, but prayer works. That's kind of our introduction, our scene setting for Hannah and what's going on. But I guess what I'm trying to say to you is she felt like a nobody. And I guess that's how we all feel as well. All she could sense was her burden. Yet God used her. And God can use us too. Let's just pray for a moment. Father, thank you for this, this account of Hannah and her life and her challenges and her pain. Father, thank you that in it we see that you are not immune to the stuff of life that we all go through, that you hear our cry. And for us and where we're at with all our issues, and stuff that's going on, stuff that's shaping us and shaping us before you. We just say we, we don't understand it. <clears throat> we don't know what's happening. But we do want to say that we will trust you through it. Jesus, we will trust you through it. And we bring it all to you now. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen.